mouth edition. Put a finger down if you've ever raised your voice at a family member. Put a finger down if you've ever made an excuse to get out of something. Put a finger down if you've ever made a joke that you didn't need to make. Put a finger down if you've ever been sick of yourself. Put a finger down if you've ever refused to say sorry. Now put your fingers back up. Hey, we forgive you. Just watch your mouth. chime in on the chat. Please visit mcconline.com uh, for all types of resources uh, throughout the week and also during our services uh, for kids. There's kids programming, uh, student programming, all types of resources, mcconline.com. Okay, looks like we're just about ready to get started. I do need to make mention, gather the communion elements, some juice or a cracker. We will be celebrating communion together as a church family, so you will need those items. All right, it looks like we're ready uh, to worship our King. So let's prepare our hearts, let's prepare our voices, and let's worship together. Let's go, church. Could not find a friend 
I've seen sunny days that I thought would never end. I've seen lonely times when I could not find a friend. But I always thought that I'd see you. continue to reach out to us. We glorify and exalt your name today.
Help us to always fix our eyes on you and remember you and who you are and who we are in you, God. Who I was will hardly be remembered because who you are has overcome. Now I am entirely dependent upon who you are and all you've done. Death can hold my sin and shame over me anymore. of you. Hallelujah. That we really consider all that God has done for us. How he reached out his arms, arms of salvation to gather us unto himself and to call us his own. God, may our response be one of love towards you for all that you are, for all that you've done. All oh, things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that we thought were dead are breathing in life again. Cause you caused the sun to shine on darkest night. All that you've done, we will pour out our love. This will be our anthem song Jesus we love you oh how we love you you are the one now our hearts adore sing about hope Oh, 
God, that you would lift the heads of the weary today and keep us on mission. Continue to grow our love for you and our love for others, that the world may see and know that you are God and you're a good God. You are a good Father, and we love you. Amen. Amen. You know, I often hear people talk about life like it's a roller coaster. You know, we kind of love that analogy where we say, you know, life's just like that roller coaster. You know, there's the anticipation and you got the twists and the turns and the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows, maybe an occasional loop-de-loop that'll really, really throw you. And sometimes life can, can make you sick. And sometimes, you know, life is just something that you enjoy. And so we like to think of life like a roller coaster. You know, but when I really process through that, you know, in the, in the way the world is moving right now, I, I realize life's really not like a roller coaster. But I do think life is a bit like an amusement park. You see, I'm not like a, a big fan of the amusement parks because while a roller coaster can be fun, it's very rare that you're on the roller coaster. Most of the time you're at the amusement park, you're waiting. And waiting is not all that much fun. Long lines on hot days in close quarters. Guys, that's, that's a recipe for tension to rise and for it to really start to build. And I know that's true for me. You get in those, those close quarters and long lines and there's all that waiting and, and you want to get there and you want to do something fun. But instead, there's a lot of standing around and the sun's beating down and there's a certain kind of misery that can come with that. So for me personally, I, I tend to find amusement parks less than amusing. 
People get upset and irritated and mad and you got families fighting with each other and you've got perfect strangers who are, who are staring each other down. You got people trying to get in line ahead of others and the tensions can really rise. And I feel like that's a little bit like the world we're living in right now. There's been a lot of waiting, a lot of wondering if you know, we'll ever get to get on the ride again, if it's ever gonna be fun again and the temperatures are rising and the irritation is there and there's a frustration with people and there's a frustration with culture and there's a frustration with the world around us and there's frustration with God. And the tensions are really rising. You know, my, honestly, I think my favorite thing about the amusement park now are those mist machines. You know, the ones I'm talking about, the, they just have these little stations where they have the mist blowing and, and you walk through them. There's never a line. You just walk right through them and it's ah, a moment of refreshment, a little breath of fresh air and some energy and a, and a cooling off that happens. And I really think that's what we need. We need to realize that that this life that, that we put so much stock in, that we think is this wonderful amusement park for us, this, this world, it's not our home. It's not our destination. And we need some misty moments, some times of refreshment. You know, when I think about mist and misty moments, I, I think about like uh, the mist in the morning. Early, you know, before really anyone else is up and you have the dew on the ground and maybe a little mist in the air and there's a newness and a freshness to it that's revitalizing and reviving. I also think of misty eyes. The things that, that kind of make me misty eyes. Not the, not the full on cry, not the sob, but just, just a little, little tear in the eye. I call them nose burner moments. I often have them with my kids or with Summer or something special, something sweet, just something a little out of, out of the blue catches me off guard. Maybe I'm a little sentimental or, or there's a special word or an exchange that is shared or a memory or a thought about something to come. And all of a sudden my nose starts to burn and I'll just go like this. And my family, they all know, they'll go, did you get a nose burn? I'm like, I did, just give me a sec. And those kinds of misty moments are special. But what if every day could be filled with misty moments? We're in this series in the book of James called TikTok, where I think we're really aware of, of how fleeting time is. You know, sometimes in, in the midst of waiting, it feels like it's dragging and it's taking forever, but we know that time is short. TikTok, TikTok, where does it all go? And what is our lives? What are we here for? And so our memory verse is such a great reminder of this. Our memory verse is found in James chapter 4, verse 14. This is why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Like, what is, what is your life? What a great question. What is my life? Who am I? Well, what am I here for? Well, what is this time here on this earth, these TikToks? What, what is it for? Because it's just a mist. Pfft. Here today and gone tomorrow. And there's, there's no guarantees about how long we'll be here. There's no guarantees about what will transpire. We can make all the plans in the world. And yet, what is our life? It's a mist. And it's full of, of misty moments. But when we understand, okay, wait a minute. There is a God who is eternal. He is uh, above the mist. He is the creator of all. And he has eternity in mind for his children, for his adopted sons and daughters, for his family to be with him forever. And we transcend just those simple misty moments. And we realize that, that even in the, the brevity of life and the uncertainty of life, and even in the waiting or the drudgery of life, that we are a mist. There's something greater. There's something more. Then we find a, a hope that is real and, and tangible and, and one that we can hold firm to and one that is sustaining, causing us to, to put our hope and our trust in our Father who has declared his love for us and proven his love for us again and again. And so today we find ourselves in James chapter four as we've been working through this book of the Bible. And the first thing I would like to point out to you is that worldly desires divide us from each other. Okay, so you may be wondering, okay, why is there so much division in the world? And, and it may feel like, well, it just, it came out of the blue and we didn't see it coming. Oh, come on. These, these divisions have always been here. And there, there are times and moments where we experience them a little more acutely, 
Uh, There's times when uh, the waiting gets old and the temperature is rising and the frustrations are boiling over and the irritation is insurmountable. And the divisions then are just highlighted. Those divisions become an area where we are expressing the frustration that we have, but it really comes out of these worldly desires that we have. And so if we look at this world and we say, okay, well, all my hope is is tied up in the here and now. I mean, this is my amusement park and and this is my place and this is my world that is here for my desires and to fulfill my needs and, and to meet my dreams and aspirations. Well, it's really all tied up about me and then it's really revolving around me. See, in that place, I become my own world and I'm my own God and I'm my own Lord and the rest of you are just pawns and and my plans. Wow, that's a really, really awful way to experience this life that God has entrusted to us. And so when I have these worldly desires, they divide me from other people. In James chapter three, we were reminded that we're to be peacemakers. God is calling us into his family and his kingdom to be peacemakers who, who sow peace. Like we're, we're planting peace in other people. We're sowing seeds of peace. We're handing out peace. We're making peace with other people who then reap a harvest of righteousness. Righteousness, right living. These, these misty moments, this brevity of life, the, the little bit of the, the TikTok that we have and maybe have left that we're saying, okay, wait a minute, I want to invest them. I want to, to plant seeds of, of peace that produce a harvest of righteousness. And yet we, we look around us and there's this temptation to say, no, I want division. I, I want to divide and I want to separate and I want hard lines in the sand and you're there and you're there and you're in and, and you're out and you're on my side and you're against me. When God's like, whoa, whoa, hey, hey, listen, invite people into the family of God. If you really understand who you are, that you're an adopted child of the king and you can invite others into his kingdom to say, hey, hey, come come over here. There's a place for you. Hey, you come over here. There's a place for you. Right, left, in, out, here, there, wherever. You're like, come on, there's a place for you. God makes makes peace with us. He sends his son, Jesus, to remove the, the sin, the impurities, the imperfection from us. And he makes us whole and new. And then he calls us to this ministry of reconciliation where we're helping others make peace with God. And when we do that, we We too find peace with them. But when peacemakers become pleasure seekers, they end up being people dividers. I just want you to think about that. If we don't think of ourselves as as God's children, as first and foremost peacemakers, that that God has uh, put us here on this earth to uh, live out his commands and to live out this calling that he's given us, and we abandon this peacemaking thing, because it's hard, it's challenging, it's difficult, it's, and it's not celebrated in our world. And, you know, it, it's not like nobody's out there like, like really shining the spotlight on that. And so we're like, no, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the division thing. I'm going to divide, I'm going to divide, I'm going to divide. Okay. Well, th- that happens because we have this worldly desire. We say, I-, I want what I want when I want it, how I want it, and I want it here, and I want it now, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get it. And I don't care who I hurt, because this is my life. When peacemakers become pleasure seekers, we end up being people dividers. James chapter four, verse one says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that, that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You don't have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Wow. Does this sound familiar to you? I I know uh, for me and and for many of that uh, that I've walked with over the years in in this family of God, that sometimes we abandon this this lordship of following Jesus saying, okay, Jesus, you're you're in charge, you're Lord, you're the King of Kings and and I will follow you and and I will go where you lead me. And and we abandon like the times of prayer and saying, okay, God, here I am. What do you want to do with me? 
And we stop listening to God and we just start barking our commands and our orders and saying, God, here's what I want and and here's how I want it. And then we get frustrated with him. Like, why aren't you doing what I want you to do, God? And then we we just kind of give lip service and say, well, yeah, there's that thing. And yeah, I was baptized. And yeah, yeah, I go to that church. But we're out here putting our hope in, in this world. And of course there's frustration in that. Things don't go our way. We can't control anything. We can't control other people. We can't even control ourselves. And so we get frustrated. So what causes these fights and quarrels among you? Why why are you dividing? Well, here's the deal. Our um, battles around us, they come from battles within us. So the battles that these external battles are really driven by an internal war. And the war that that is being just waged and is raging inside of us is, is this war between the spirit of God, his Holy Spirit that he puts inside of us and gives us this brand new identity, the spirit of, of power and love and self-discipline, the spirit that produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That spirit inside of us is now at war with the spirit of the sinful nature that pleasure seeking spirit that says, no, 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 it's about me. It's about what I want. And when there is war inside, there is war outside. And there will be war in every single relationship that we have. I know, I know, we all think, no, 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 I can direct it. It's fine. I can live at peace with my family and and I can live at peace with my friends while I go to war against those people, or I go to war in the office place, or I go to war at my school, or I go to war with my neighbors, or whoever it is that you've decided is gonna be your enemy. Uh, it's just, it's, it's really a reflection of what's going on on the inside. When you have peace with God, now all of a sudden you're free to be a peacemaker, to sow seeds of, of peace in these relationships everywhere you go and to reap a harvest of righteousness. So right out of that text, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Well, it's from the battles that come within us. And so we, we see this our, when our desires are strong. We want something. We, we really want it. And, and we're not even asking God, is this appropriate for me? Is God, is this what you want? We're not aligning our hearts to God. We're not saying, God, help me to want what you want. Uh, God, let me in on what you're doing. We're just saying, no, no, my desires are paramount. I mean, when we do that, we're exalting ourselves above all else. Not only are we becoming our own gods, but now we're trying to be gods of everyone else. Like, hey, my desires are most important. You know, you got to look out for number one and I'm number one. So here, come and, and bow at me and, and meet my needs. It's also when our prayers are weak. Our prayers are, are weak. What are we even asking God for? Hey God, I, I, need, I need this little bit more provision. I, I'm, I'm going to need this right now. I'm going to need you to, you know, to, to take care of this amusement park of life for me. What are we even asking him to do? They're weak. There's no faith in them. We don't actually even think that God will do them. We don't actually trust him with him. We're not saying, yeah, God, I'm sure of this and I'm certain of this. It's like, eh, maybe it's worth a shot. It's like we're playing the lottery, buying a scratch off. Eh, Okay, well, today it didn't work. We'll try again tomorrow, maybe. And when our vision is skewed, we've taken our eyes off Jesus, taken our eyes off his kingdom, we're looking at ourselves and we're saying this life is primarily about me. We can't even understand what God is really up to and his plan to save the world and how he's called us to be a part of that. And so we have these divisive desires, these worldly desires that divide us. They divide us from each other. So my friends, there's no shock that we live in a, in a world that is at war with each other. No shock at all. And by the way, there's no lack of reasons to divide. I'm not even saying they're they're not valid, the the things that that can be there, of course. But you solve one, there's going to be 10 more lined up behind them. They're going to keep coming. The, The real issue here is, do we have peace with God? And so while worldly desires divide us from each other, I think and I hope you'll realize that worldly desires also divide us from God. That's this root cause here. So a lot of times we get very interested in treating the symptoms when God's got a cure. He's got a cure for us for what's actually the problem. 
So we get really focused on symptomatic treatments and trying to alleviate some pain. And, and I'm, not, I'm not saying those things aren't important, but when God has a cure, we have, we have the cure. That's why I, I, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. I'm all Jesus all the time. I want you to know about Jesus. Jesus is the cure. He's the great physician and he has a cure. Uh, what this world needs is Jesus. That's what this world needs. It needs Jesus. I know that. That's why, that's why I'm never going to stop talking about Jesus. That's why I'm going to tell you, pray for one. God, please give me one person to share your love with because my love's not sufficient. It's not enough. Man, I need his love. And I need his love to, to come inside of me and, and flush my system and, and drive out all that self and so that what is bubbling out of me, what is coming out of, out of my mouth and, and my actions and and my thoughts is the love of Jesus, sacrificial, unending, no strings attached, perfect love of Jesus, this love that, that binds us together. But these worldly desires, when we, when we think that this life is all about me and, and what I want and how I want it, and they divide us from God, we can't even recognize what he's up to. Verse four says, you adulterous people, don't you know that Friendship with the world means enmity against God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of this world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And there's some strong language here. You adulterous people. When, when we give our hearts to this world, to the TikToks, to, to this little time and place, and this is our hope and everything we've dreamed about, and it becomes about our needs and desires and, and our wishes and, and our wants, we've set ourselves up in opposition to God. We've become enemies of God. And God doesn't want a divided heart. He longs for the spirit he created inside of us that, that he knew us before he even knit us together in our mother's wombs, that he longs for us as a father longs for his children. And he has a home for us and he's calling us there. And he doesn't want us to be divided, but he is calling us to him. And so we don't have to live in this duplicitous way. Instead, by, by daily submitting ourselves to God and, and humbly laying down our lives. That's why Jesus says, you want to be my disciples? Yes, here's what it takes. Daily, lay down your lives take up your crosses and then come follow him. And I, I know maybe, maybe that language just seems confusing to you and completely foreign. That's because it's not the language of this world. The language of this world does, does not celebrate, uh, let alone even tolerate this idea of laying down your life, submitting it, saying, you know what, I, I, I'm going to live for another. I'm going I'm to serve him. And taking up a cross, willfully dying to self and being sacrificial, being, being kind to those who are cruel, being patient to those who are impatient, being gentle with those who are harsh, We have a tendency to say, no, 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 I like this. I like this eye for an eye and, and tooth for a tooth. I, I, I like that. I understand that. I, I know. But where does it take in you? I mean, think about it. Our, our life is just a mist here today and, and gone tomorrow. And, and yet God has something so much greater for us. And so these worldly desires divide us from God. So let's think about the heart of God. Th this is the heartbeat of God. The heart of God is that he longs for people, for all people, not just a few and not just the people who, who do what he wants and, 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 you know, respond to him how he wants them to. So this is the heart of God where we would begin to long for all people and have a love for them, regardless of how they've treated us or treated others. He longs for people. He doesn't want to divide from them. He listens to prayers. He hears. 
He hears our hearts and he allows us to express what we're thinking and feeling. And that's the great thing about God is he is big and he is strong. And, and as we get through this frustration and, and we just spew it all over him, he's able to say, okay, my child, come here. I'm going to take you. I'm going to hold you. And I'm going to give you a new perspective. He doesn't cast us out like, oh, how dare you speak to me this way? He says, okay, I can, let's go. I can hear you. You need to throw a temper tantrum. All right. I mean, honestly, if you're going to do it, I, I'd much rather you, me or you, all of us do it with God than do it to somebody else. That's why daily meeting with him and, and expressing our hearts, he hears our prayers. And so we, we can listen to others as well. He lavishes grace lavishes it. He pours it out in such abundance. Grace is unmerited favor. I, I know right now you, like you may be thinking, well, okay, yeah, God does that, but you know what? People, you, you know what? People don't deserve it. That's well, kind of the point. I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. Nobody deserves it. We don't deserve it from God and nobody really deserves it from us. But if you have it, my goodness, we better give it. And not in short supply, but lavish it. Like if you've received grace, then you know you have received an abundance of grace and his grace is sufficient and it's more than enough. And now we can share this grace with others, unmerited favor, a free gift, no strings attached to be gracious. And he lifts up the humble, the humble, not, not the proud, He's not exalting the proud, those who, who think, okay, God, I'm coming to you and let's face it, God, you're awfully lucky to have me. I bring a lot to the table. What a terrible attitude. I mean, hopefully like you're, you're going, okay, that was pretty ridiculous. Like God, that, that's not what God, God exalts those who are, who are humble. And he says, here, I'm gonna use, uh, I'm gonna use this person. I'm gonna speak through this person. And this person is gonna be a peacemaker who sows peace and has a harvest of righteousness. And so as we humbly submit to God, this is what we experience in him because that's who he is. And so really what, what we find here is humility is such a key. Humble surrender restores us to God. So what we have here is you know, symptomatically, we have this relationship uh, where with people, with the world around us, our families and our coworkers and our neighbors and uh, maybe even, you know, our country or the world at large. And we're saying, whoa, there's problems, there's division, there's whew, so much happening and it's such a heavy weight. Okay, well, that's a symptom of, of our division with God. So the answer here is how do we make peace with God? How do we do that? Well, humble surrender. Humble surrender is what restores us to God. It, when we humbly surrender to him, when we say, okay, God, I, I, I'm not gonna go to war against you anymore, but I, I'm gonna surrender to you. You know, like both hands up, like, God, I, I'm, I, I'm in, I, I, I quit. I'm not gonna fight you. And when we surrender to his Holy Spirit within us, then this is where we're restored into this right relationship with God where he is Lord and we are under his authority and he is paramount. He is supreme. It's his desires that guide and lead us in, into e eternal things. Not worldly things, but eternal things. Verse 7 of James 4 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. All right, so we go back to this separation from God, this, this friendship with the world. All right, now to be clear here, when we're talking about world, I want you to understand it. For God so loved the world that he would give his one and only son. God loves the world. He loves people. He loves his creation. And we too in Christ Jesus are called to love like God does, to, to love people people to love his creation. But when it's talking about being friends of the world, it means that our, all of our hope is, is wrapped up in here and now, and we're going to pursue 
whatever ends are necessary, whatever, whatever methods are necessary to get to the end we want, which is our own self-gratification and basically us being lords. That's a worldly, uh, us being lords, it's a worldly mentality. And so uh, the answer here is this humble surrender to God where we say, okay, well, wait a minute, I'm, I, I'm recognized I'm, I'm living that way right now. That's why I'm so worked up. That's why I'm so afraid. That's why I'm so anxious. That's why I'm so stressed out. I, I, I'm, I'm living in this, in this way. And so we humbly surrender to God and he will lift us up. So here's our prescription for redemption. Our prescription for redemption. It's right out of the text, okay? So we've got a few things here. Submit. Submit to God. No, I know, right? It runs contrary. The worldly mentality says submit to no one, never surrender, never give up. And yet we submit to God. Ah, yes, God, we yield to him. Next, uh, resist. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist him. Be aware of, of the temptations that are there and say, no, that's not who I am. That's not what I'm created for. Uh, next, come near to God and he will come near to you. That, those simple steps of faith to God saying, okay, God, I'm, I'm coming near. I want, I want you. I long for you. I desire you to, to carve out time to listen and, and to be with God and, and to yield to him and submit to him in prayer and to encounter him in the scriptures. Wash your hands, you sinners. Why, yeah, like, it, it's a repent. Like, we're, we're in this hand washing, you know, faith. Like we're realizing, hey, washing our hands is a good thing. We should wash our hands more often. Yeah, we should repent from sin a lot more often too. Anytime something's off there, wait a minute, something's wrong, something's not happening. Is there sin in me? Search my heart, God, show me. Oh, oh God, yes, yeah, clean me, wash me. Next, purify your hearts. God, what, instead of trying to hide things away in our hearts and, and, and compartmentalize and say, okay, well, this is mine, God. You can have this over here. That's fine. But this I'm going to keep right over here. This is, this is mine to protect and to hide away from you to say, okay, God, search me, know my heart, purify me from all unrighteousness. Whatever is in me that is not of you, let's go ahead and allow that to be washed out, to be purified. Grieve, mourn, and wail over the, the damage that we've done. So often we're, we're angry and mad at God because of the damage we see. But when's the last time we actually like, grieved over our own sin and the destruction that we've caused and the harm that has come out of our mouths or out of our actions or inaction to grieve, mourn, and wail and and, and, and to repent of that and, and to say, wait a minute, God, I, I want something new. And then humble yourselves before the Lord. You're in that place when you submit, resist, come near, wash your hands, purify your hearts, grieve, mourn, and well, to then humbly submit yourself to God and say, okay, God, now I'm available for you. How, how will you use me? And when we are humbly surrender to God, we're restored to God. And that same humble surrender, it's so powerful. That same humble surrender that restores us to God, check this out. That same humble surrender that restores us to God will then restore us to each other. Don't flip-flop it. Humbly surrender to God, be restored to him, allow him to do this amazing work in our hearts. And then out of a new heart and peace with God, the internal peace that we have with God will then manifest itself in all of our relationships, our relationships in our families, our relationships in our neighborhoods and our workplaces and schools and our communities at large and with the broader world and the culture around us. But it comes out of a new heart and a new relationship with God. James 4 verse 11, it says, brothers and sisters, I love that, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, family. Do not slander one another. Well, I, okay, I just want to read one. Don't slander one another. Just knock it off with the accusations and the, the name calling and the finger pointing and the gross assumptions and the divisive on purpose like activities. It's, don't slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge and one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? 
Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. It's such a, a richness in these words that God has preserved for us. And I hope that you'll spend some time reading through James 4, listening to God, meditating on that, chewing on these words. It's, they're so powerful and, and so rich. Don't slander one another. Don't judge one another. God is the judge. And that's not to say that we're, we're not able to determine right from wrong. Of, of course we can. We can see something that's wrong and say, well, that's wrong. That, that's not how God intends. Yes. But to sit in judgment of another means that there's a punitive element. Okay, now, now I'm going to punish. There's only one judge. And we can't sit in judgment of the law. We, we can receive God's law. We can receive his commands. We can humbly submit to them. And then we can live out in, in this peace that we have with God that then will radiate from us and create a harvest of righteousness as we sow peace into others. And so as we look at our lives and we say, okay, I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna make that happen, I'm gonna have this happen, and this is everything planned out. Whoa, 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 we don't know. What is your life? And I, I love this. God's telling us, hey, your life is a mist. It's a mist. I, I know we look at this world. This is why sometimes it's so hard to understand what God's up to and where this frustration is. We look at this world like it is the pinnacle of all existence and the be all end all. And everything is just wrapped up in right here and right now. And we, we got to go and get the most pleasure we can in the shortest amount of time. And God's like, whoa, whoa, time's not even an issue. TikTok, it's not even an issue. That's a created thing. And he says, I'm over that creation and you are invited into a kingdom that is outside of it, eternal. And I know you, I know that he, he, says, that he says, he knows that we're, we're, we're so wrapped up in it, but he's like, whoa, relax. Hey, you don't, you don't control any of this. Your, li your life's a mist. It's a mist. And instead, we ought to say, okay, Lord, if it's your will, it's not wrong to, to make plans. It's not, it's, but it, God, if it's your will, to bring anything that we would think or want to do to before him and say, hey God, is this what you want? Is this where you want me to be? Is this how you want me to live? Is this, is this what you have for this miss that you've entrusted to me? And as I think about what is your life, it is a mist. I go back to, uh, the amusement park in my mind. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? There's a lot of frustration there. And there can be some good times too, but there, there's long periods of some frustration there. And it's hot and it can be crowded and you can get your toes stepped on. But to go through that mist machine and to go, oh, okay. There's that moment where you're like, oh, wow, that felt good. Okay. I can, I can go a little longer, maybe till I get to the, the next Miss Machine. Church, th those of you who, who have a relationship with Jesus, who are part of the family of God, your life is a mist. What if, what if we became that for the world? In a world that's frustrated and mad and hot and afraid and, and irritated and angry. What if we were the strategically placed mist machines and the lives of other people. That when they passed by us, there was a refreshment, a cooling off, a moment of, oh, okay. That's what God's calling you to. What is your life? Well, it's a mist. So just be mist. Bring refreshment. Bring relief, bring peace. But the only way to do that is to have peace with God. And so right now, here's a perfect opportunity to first of all, make peace with God. He's provided a way through his son, Jesus. And to humbly submit to him and to say, 
God, I need your grace. My goodness, like say it out loud. Like, God, I need your grace. Go ahead, say it out loud. God, I need your grace. Because I've sinned. Confess that, because I've sinned. And even right, like right now you can say, God, God, show me where that's the case. And you can trust him with that. With the thoughts and the words and the, the actions or the inaction. To have peace with God, to say, okay, God, here I am. I'm submitting to you. And right now, as, as we pray and worship him in this way, by humbly humbling ourselves before him and exalting him, allowing him to do his work in us, we have peace with God. And then that peace will move out of us to others. And so I want to pray a blessing over you right now and just invite you to receive the refreshment and the renewal that God provides and then to be that for others. Father, thank you that uh, right now you are bringing refreshment and revival and renewal. And God, as you do that in us, let us be missed for others. Let us make peace with you so that we can help make peace with others and they'll know who you are too. And we ask for that in Jesus' name.
We just read about in James how it says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Later, James says, if you cling to God, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So right now we celebrate this, this time of communion, knowing that, man, we have grace that God provides, grace that goes beyond anything we can earn or deserve. So we celebrate this moment, the victory that we resist the devil. So let's take this bread and let's eat it together right now, celebrating the victory we have in Jesus Christ. And this cup, it's a celebration that we are in this new life with Christ. The old is gone and the new has come, so let's drink right now to the King. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words that we've learned in James. And Father, how to control our tongues and how do we cling to you And how do we submit, Father? And that through that, we have this grace that is so incredible. So I thank you for that grace. I thank you for the truth that you provide. And we celebrate the victory we have today in Jesus. In that name we pray, amen. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jason Rose. I'm the Bedford Campus Pastor. We truly want to hear from you. So please take the time and fill out the Connect card. If you have a prayer request or concern, we want to know about it. God tells us in his word to worship him by giving financially. So at MCC, we worship God obediently in this way. And God moves through us to connect people to him, to other people, and to his mission. There are several ways to give at MCC. Just text the word "Give MCC" to 77977. You can set up a recurring gift through the app or through the website at manchesterchristian.com backslash give. You can also mail your check to 1308 Wellington Road, Manchester, New Hampshire, 03104. But let's take some time and pray over these gifts and what God is doing in our lives. Father, we thank you that we can come to you. And Father, that we can release things that we want to control in our lives. May you bless these gifts right now, Father, that they may expand your kingdom. We truly want more people in the kingdom in the shortest time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In case you haven't heard, we are so excited that we are regathering in person July 12th at the physical campuses. 9 o'clock at the Camp Concord campus, 10 o'clock at the Manchester campus, and 11 o'clock at the Bedford campus. July 12th, don't forget it, Bo sent out an email. We would love for you to check out the video. It's going to be uh, on our website at mcconline.com. In just a moment, we're going to continue in worship and song, but I have this question for you. If anybody out there wants to accept Jesus as your Christ and your Lord and Savior, today's the day to do that. There's going to be a phone number on the screen. I would love to talk with you personally, or we have in-person chat that they would love to answer your questions. So do that at this time. But we're so excited. Let's continue in singing and rejoice that today is the day the Lord has made. We love you, church. Keep praying for one. We'll see you July 12th.
dare to trace out all you are But when I think about the road you took for love I know your grace will stay the path to light up the way of your heart and move me like you do the mountain move me like you do the wind oh yeah yeah and I'll chase your voice through the dark